In the Heber Springs area, there are several decent trails that you can take overlooking Greer's Ferry Lake and the Little Red River. And one of them happens to be the Mossy Bluff National Nature Trail. Let's check it out. The Mossy Bluff National Nature Trailhead is located at the William Carl Garner Visitor Center. The trail meanders along a wooden bluff and ends at the Mossy Bluff Overlook, which offers a great vista of the Little Red River and Greer's Ferry Dam. This is an excellent place to rest and enjoy the views before hiking back to the visitor center for a round trip of 1.6 miles. It's natural beauty. It's mountainous, but it's rolling. It has a lot of nice overlooking beauty. As compared to some of the other mountain ranges, you, you just gotta kind of drive for miles and stop. But here, you just kind of drive and keep looking. You know, it's a lot of plateaus, I guess. A lot of peaks. So, you know, it's, it's interesting seeing the history with the dam. So, and the hatchery, that was interesting. We thought that was interesting. I was wondering where the cold water was coming from to raise the trout. We're from Missouri and we just like to get out and explore different states and we decided this would be a good area to start our uh, exploring Arkansas. And uh, so we had to come by and see the dam and beautiful view. Just wish the sun was shining. <laughs> well, if you have time, you'll have to fish in the Little Red. Yes, we'd love to, to do that. Didn't take our equipment along this time, but love to do that sometime. It's quite evident how the Mossy Bluff Trail got its name. The bluff along the stairway near the overlook is mossy indeed. There's also the Buckeye National Nature Trail, which was built in conjunction with the Mossy Bluff Trail to provide a quality trail experience to persons not physically able to negotiate the regular trail. The Buckeye Trail is paved and is wheelchair accessible. Picnic tables along this short 660 foot long trail provide a wonderful opportunity to eat under the forest canopy. The Buckeye Trailhead is located at the middle portion of the Mossy Bluff Trail just off the paved road which parallels the trail. You can also access the Mossy Bluff Trail at this midsection if you don't want to hike the entire trail. Once you do get back to the visitor center, it would be worth your while to check it out as well. The exhibits portray the history of this area, the pioneers who settled here, and the operation of the dam forming the Little Red River. Tony Eliason of Bentonville is one of those guys who probably a lot of other kayakers and canoeists envy because Tony actually builds the boats he takes out on the water. Back after I graduated high school back in Iowa, I went to carpentry school for just a year learning how to build homes. And then 20 years later or so, I'm doing a job in Bella Vista and I'm asked to take up this old deck and replace it with new deck boards. After I realized what I had, I had some really good cedar wood, two by six, 16 feet long. I thought, this is some good rare wood that's hard to find. What am I gonna do with it? So I eventually came up with the idea of let's do a wood strip kayak because they're beautiful and I've never done one, it'd be a challenge. 
So I went where everybody goes if you want to learn something new these days. I went to YouTube. There's a lot of resources on YouTube. If you want to learn how to build a boat, you can. If you want to learn how to be your own dentist, I think they've got something on there for that too. It's pretty amazing. But I did my research and I just decided, let's just go. Do it and see what happens. And ended up making my share of mistakes, learning from them, and just kept pressing forward and ended up learning how to build boats. Cutting out the hatch in a wooden kayak is critical, and there's really no room for error. So what we have to do is find out the exact position to make this hatch cover. So what you do is you measure about 13 or 14 times and make sure you got the right place before you cut. Because if you cut it wrong, there's no going back. You're done. When you get to the end, I'll just uh, put my hand underneath there and so it won't fall. And so I offered Tony my assistance since I didn't want to see a nearly finished kayak with about 250 hours of work end up on the wood pile outside. You did it, Chuck. Good job. In case you're wondering how do you make a wooden kayak waterproof, Tony uses a fiberglass resin combination. What the fiberglass does, it strengthens what you've got and it protects it. This is, a, this is a sheet of the fiberglass, and what you do is you just simply drape it over in a large sheet over the whole thing. And while it's there, you mix up resin and hardener together. You pour it on top, and as that liquid hits that fiberglass, it, it, this actually will disappear. So as you're looking at this right here, you're looking through this, and you're seeing the wood in there. So it's a really neat thing. Tony likes to use several types of wood in his boat construction. We do use the cedars a lot, uh, but every one of these woods has its own characteristics. You know, some is soft and flexible, some is real hard. If I was to use a maple, it resists cutting and it actually tears out. Before it will let itself be cut, the fibers tear out, it's that hard. But the cedars, they take sanding real smooth, so they're really differently. They work differently. And actually the, wood's, the wood is kind of like people. Some of us are easy to work with. We do what we're supposed to do with little fuss, but then some of us are a bit harder to work with. We're harder to shape and we resist being worked and we tear out instead of being shaped into what we're supposed to be. And you know, when I take a piece of wood, I'll cut it, I'll shape it, I will scrape it, I will sand on it, and if necessary, I apply a lot of heat and twist that wood so I can turn it into what it's supposed to be. And then when I'm done, I've got a beautiful product. Well, I find the Lord is like that with people. He can take some real rough stock and twist them into something that they never thought, never thought they could be. What Tony does isn't exactly a lost art, but those folks who are skilled at this are far and few between. It is rare to find people in this area who do this kind of craft. You know, we may have 300 million people in the US and only maybe a thousand of us know how to build these things. So it, it's a rare skill. Um, I wish more people would try to build them, not just to make a beautiful thing, but to actually enjoy putting wood together and creating something. There's no better accomplishment, no better feeling of satisfaction than taking a pile of lumber, stripping it up, and ending up with a boat that you can actually go out and use. So the moral to this story, according to Tony Eliason, is whatever it is that you've always wanted to do, whether it's building a boat or doing something else, just do it. A lot of people they hear I build a wooden boat and they say, wow, that's, that's really neat. I've always wanted to do that. One guy even said, I went out and bought the book. I was ready to build it. I just never got around to it. Well, I'm hoping today as people see this, 
they'll hear my story that I took a pile of lumber and made a, a neat looking boat out of it. I hope that inspires them to look at their own bucket list and say, I need to do something for myself. I've always wanted to, let's say, if you've always wanted to run a marathon, well, go out and buy a pair of running shoes, and tomorrow, go run a mile. If you've always wanted to go skydiving, make a phone call, make the appointment, and go skydiving. Do it, there's no excuse not to. If you've ever wanted to ride a bull, well, call your doctor and have your head examined, because that's just silly. But, be inspired. If you wanted to do something, just do it. Don't let any excuses get in the way, whether it's building a boat or something else. Do that thing that you've always wanted to do. And in just a little bit, in just a little bit, we're going to hike red, blue, green, and yellow, and we're going to hike to the Washita Bluff. It is a famous bluff. We're going to talk about explorers that came up the bluff in 1804, and did you know in this area there were buffaloes and bears that lived right here? With students from Washita Baptist University in Arkadelphia and area fourth grade students, a unique outdoor learning experience has been taking place utilizing the Washita River Bluff area. We started this in um, 2009 when we ran across what's called place-based education, and you go to a place and you study what is so-called famous about that area. So for Arkadelphia, it's the Washita River Bluff. And uh, so since then, we've brought over 2,000 fourth graders to the bluff. We've developed four learning stations. So they get to see the bluff, but then they talk about the watershed, maps and compasses, the Hunter Dunbar expedition. And uh, so it's been my college students that do the teaching and the fourth graders do the learning but I'm not for sure it's not the other way around. You know, our students learn from them and then they also, you know, teach our students. So it's a it's a win-win situation for Washita. It's a win-win for the fourth graders that come. I like just the nature and the beautiness of all the trees and I learned a lot about the compass and how many years or weeks that it takes to decompose. Yeah, when you leave and, trash, huh? Mm-hmm. And it's just beautiful out here. Especially that overlook of the river, right? Mm-hmm. I definitely think it's very beneficial. Like when I was a kid, I loved going outdoors. And so camping was one of my favorite things. So I'm um, enjoying getting these kids um, able to come out here and have fun like I did. So. And get an education. Mm -hmm. Right. An education such as about that forgotten expedition the Hunter Dunbar Expedition of 1804, which Thomas Jefferson sent out in addition to Lewis and Clark to explore the then Washita River and the Hot Springs. When you use a map, it's, it's better to use a compass because it will tell you which better ways to go because like, you wouldn't, sometimes some people don't know where they're going on the map, so you could really use the compass to help you. They were better than I expected today. Um, they were, some grades were a little wild than others, but um, they were able to come around, at least know which direction, uh, maybe how to orient, orient a, a uh, map a little bit. They, were, they had smiles, they enjoyed what they were doing, so it was better than the classroom, they said. Yes, much better than a classroom, and that's been the problem. 
not enough kids getting out into the outdoor classroom. A lot of them, they stay in school. They're in a town like Arkadelphia today. These kids came up. A lot of them don't get the opportunity to come out, learn about our history of Arkansas, go out, know how to canoe, learn about tents, how to build fires, what, what our history was, what kind of animals we had. A lot of the kids, public schools, they don't let them get to come out. I feel like this is a great opportunity for them to come out and learn what all Arkansas has to offer. This, this trail has been a blessing for Washita and uh, the students around here. Get to go outside, learn history first person at a Arkansas Bluff on the DeSoto Trail. Well, this is your first time to be here, and you live here in Arkansas. Just when we thought we visited all the Civil War battlefields in the state, add one more. Reed's Bridge Battlefield, south of Jacksonville. Reed's Bridge was once a toll bridge named after the owner. And the battle that took place here in August of 1863 left seven Union dead, along with two Confederates. Reed's Bridge Battlefield along Biomeda is on the National Register of Historic Places with national significance by virtue of its status as the most intact of the three battlefields associated with the nationally significant Little Rock campaign and the battlefield that best represents that campaign. It's also noteworthy as the battle that weakened the Union drive to capture Little Rock and for its role as a catalyst leading to a duel a week later between two Confederate generals. Basically what was happening was the Union Army was trying to get to Little Rock and uh, Military Road, which is now Highway 161, was really the only established road and when you've got wagons and supplies and cannons and things like that, you want to go the path of least resistance, and that was this road. Um, the, the Confederates obviously were trying to stop the Union Army, and the battle took place here on the 26th and the 27th of August. Um, the Confederates held them for about those two days, and then they realized they couldn't hold the Union Army back any longer, so they retreated across the bridge and they set fire to the bridge. The Union Army tried to rush the bridge, but the Confederates just cut them to pieces. And so the Union Army retreated and they had to find another way to get to Little Rock. And that didn't happen until about September the 10th or the 11th. And by that time, everything of military value and most of the Confederates had already abandoned Little Rock. Interesting to note that having foreseen the probability of falling back across Biomeda, a Captain John Mahoon, a rebel engineer, had given Reed's Bridge a thorough coating of tar and other flammable material earlier, and as the last of the rear guard crossed it, the bridge was torched. At the Jacksonville Museum of Military History, which by the way is one of the most prestigious of its kind in the nation, you can examine artifacts from the battlefield such as the actual weapons that were used, bullets, shrapnel, and bolts from Reed's Bridge. At Reed's Bridge Battlefield Heritage Park, you can also tour an 1860s replica of a homestead and farmstead.
This is what a homestead would have looked like in Arkansas in the 1860s. And so you would have started with an, a really small cabin just to have a roof over your head. And then you would have next built a barn to protect your livestock. And then probably your kitchen, which is always separate from the main living quarters. Um, it wasn't uncommon for the kitchen to catch on fire. And obviously you didn't want your whole house to burn down. And then finally you would have built a larger cabin for the family. And you have uh, reenactments here? Uh, we do from time to time have reenactments, yes. The Confederates and the Union fight it out. Kind of ends the same way every time, but it's still pretty entertaining. <laughs> but the, uh, the thing with this, though, uh, this is on the actual battlefield. Right, <laughs> this is actually on the battlefield. Now, you would not have put a homestead on this site. This site frequently floods, and so you would not have put one here but con for convenience sake, and eventually um, we'll probably want to do some living histories out here. We have the garden, and we've planted the type of heritage plants that they would have planted back in the 1860s. And there's also a water trail along Biomeda here too. You right. One takes a kayak or canoe. Yeah, you can take a kayak or canoe. Now it is seasonal, so you have to make sure there's, we've had a good rain. Um, and then there's also a really nice walking trail that follows along the bayou. And we have signage along the uh, walking trail that gives more in-depth stories of the Battle of Reed's Bridge. Reed's Bridge Battlefield also happens to be along the Trail of Tears. It was part of the Trail of Tears. And actually this road, as I mentioned, was called Military Road. And part of the purpose of them building Military Road was for Indian removal. And so this was part of the land route of Indian removal. One of the first tribes to cross the bridge here at Biomeda were the Choctaw in 1831. Then later, some 17,000 Cherokee were divided into detachments for the journey west. One of those detachments consisted of about 660 Cherokee who crossed the bridge in December of 1838, and it's possible they camped in the general vicinity. This detachment was the last large party of Native Americans who used the bridge during the Trail of Tears. So pay a visit for yourself to Reed's Bridge Battlefield just south of Jacksonville. And for more on this destination, plus many of our others, or to order a copy of an episode, visit our website at aetn.org slash exploringarkansas. And don't forget to like us on our Facebook fan page. And we'll see you again the next time for another exciting adventure on Exploring Arkansas.